Hello, I'm Artemis, and in today's episode, we witness the drowning of the Trueran Valley, a devastating event which galvanised the Welsh nationalist cause. to think of history as a gradual accumulation of events, buildings, people, but we don't spend as much time thinking about its dead ends. That's exactly what my guest today, Dr Matthew Green, does in his brilliant new book, Shadowlands, A Journey Through Lost Britain. Shadowlands shows how, in Matthew's words, our country's history is shaped by absences. The end result is a curious, haunting, yet also strangely uplifting alternative history of the British Isles. For today's episode, Matthew chose to travel through time to the beautiful Welsh valley of Trewaran. Up until the 1960s, the valley had been home to the village of Capel Caelan, one of the few predominantly Welsh-speaking communities left in Wales. In 1955, the inhabitants of Capel Caelan came across an article in the Welsh edition of the Liverpool Daily Post. It said that the Liverpool City Corporation had identified the Trueran Valley as the ideal location to build a reservoir and dam that could serve the drinking water needs of the people of Liverpool. The result of this was, Capel Caelan was to be drowned. Dr Matthew Green is a historian, writer and broadcaster with a doctorate from Oxford University. His most recent book, Shadowlands, A Journey Through Lost Britain, is published by Faber. So I got to speak to Matthew in person can you believe, at Soho Radio Studios just last week. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. First, I wanted to ask you, you're a historian of London initially. That was your first yeah. your first book. And I was really struck by London is obviously a place that is very, very much alive and loud and busy. How did you come to decide to write a book about places that are dead or quiet? Yes, yeah, the opposite. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, firstly, I'd say the, the, the places I look at that they were once brimming with life and full of people and laughter and bells and dreams. Now, most of them are, are mere kind of spectral echoes, like rotted into the or sometimes just pure absences. But I appreciated that sort of dramatic tension between somewhere in its prime, like a sprawling city in the Middle Ages, like Dunwich or Winchelsea, versus what it's become. Also, I think in the London book, I was sort of trying to resurrect aspects of lost London, Mm. you know, like the experience of going into a Georgian jelly house or a Stuart coffee house or an an anchorite cell or a bear pit. So there was an element of trying to evoke that which has faded. And there was a sense that I wanted to go from, you know, lost London to lost Britain after hearing um, the story of a a drowned medieval city called Dunwich. It sort of just sparked the imagination and and because so much was going on in the world, everything was like melting down and changing form with Brexit and Trump and the pandemic. It felt sort of timely um, mm. and not least because of the um, climate change mm. angle um, as well. So it's it, you're right, though, it, it is sort of more mournful, I guess, a bit more lyrical. But I really wanted to you know, resurrect these places in as much kind of vivid detail as possible to make them sort of reappear again, if only in the reader's mind. And it is mournful, but it's also very beautiful and weirdly kind of, I don't know, I found it uplifting in places as well. So it's not, I don't want listeners to think it's just a really, really depressing <laughs> No, I'm <laughs> really, uh, yeah, that wouldn't be the best, uh, yeah, pit. but no, I, I'm really glad you said that because I um, was obviously a little bit wary when I began. I was like, gosh, I'm about to go on a itinerary of destruction, <laughs> places that have been ravaged and ruined and destroyed. Is this not going to be a little bit depressing? Mm. Um, but the, the, just as you say, that they are weirdly uplifting. Um, if you meditate upon these ruins, the, there's a beauty, you know, which is often quite at odds with the suddenness and violence of the fate, just the kind of lonely priory, um, windswept meadows, um, villages underwater, um, you know, like ghost streets and plague villages. It, it, Henry James said that if you go to somewhere like Dunwich, um, he said like the the minor key is struck with such felicity it leaves no sigh unbreathed. And it, it, they are salutary, they, they are sort of emotionally tranquilizing and it puts things into perspective. So I'm glad because it could have, could have been gloomy and morbid as hell. Mm. <laughs> 
You open the book by saying that when you decided to write it, you were determined to discover to what extent our country has been shaped by absences. I think is the phrase you use. Mm -hmm. To what extent did you find out that it is, and in what way? Well, to quite a significant um, degree, and and, and th this is the strange thing because these places have largely all disappeared. You can't see them; they're not really there. But they have left a legacy um, upon the landscape, um, upon the imagination, um, upon the way Britain has coalesced. And it, you know, it, it's not always obvious. But like, to give one sort of quite unexpected example, you know, after the Black Death. You know, we do hear quite a lot about the the you know peasants um workers rights revolution because they've got more bar purchasing power and they can negotiate higher wages but then the flip side of that was that the landowners simply said well i can't be dealing with these querulous peasants um so they were evicted on mass um and sheep were moved in there's a man eating sheep as they appear in the um because that was more cost effective so 3000 villages just in england alone vanished and became pasture and those places don't exist anymore so when you look at a map it really has been influenced by um you know the the, the reason it looks as it is is because all these places were vanished mm. because of that um also in in other ways you know the as industrialization gathered pace that 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 comes with a cost um you know as, as we're going to be talking about later sometimes rather a sort of dramatic one like certain things have to be sacrificed and it's you know you can go right back to the first place i look at um scarra bray mm. which was actually this older than stonehenge um older um even than the pyramids and that took place in the sort of hinterland of when humanity stopped being nomadic hunter gatherers and began to put down roots and it's actually one of the earliest settled communities sustained by agriculture buried in sand for 5,000 years hence it's still there but you could almost say that this is the, the point from where our, uh, the point from which our entire civilized history unfolds because you know w without permanent settlements you can't have the um, development of sort of politics and culture and um, civilization um, so you know that place kind of explains why we have a map at all and when you look at a map I was really struck by this a map in 1225 looks utterly different to a map, say, in, you know, 1975. Mm. And it's kind of chilling to think what what will a map of 22, 22 look like compared to today? Mm. And it, it, it could be quite horrifically different. And that leads us really nicely onto the next question that I wanted to ask you about, which is about the future. Um, and you reflect on that in, in, the, in the coda of the book. And you've mentioned climate change already. Revisiting all of these places that have been destroyed, how did it make you feel about the future of, <laughs> of humanity, if that's not too big a question? Um, well, yes, depressed <laughs> to some extent. Just... What was something that struck me was that the these places I I visited the villages towns but even cities they they were very often completely unaware that they were in the shadow of oblivion. If you spoke to um, a wine merchant in Winchelsea or a cordwainer and done, they had absolutely no idea that there were going to be these ferocious sea storms which were going to just sweep great bloody swaths of these places into the sea and drown them. Nor really did anyone expect the Black Death, I, I think it's fair to say. But we do, we, we, we know full well what is going to happen, what is likely to happen, um, unless dramatic and, and, and um, kind of coordinated action is taken to reduce carbon emissions. And, and yet the paradox, it seems to me, is that we, a lot of people sort of look out of the window and so don't really see that much changing. So they're like, oh, this can't really be urgent. So we we do know that we're a lot of our, particularly coastal settlements are in the shadow of annihilation. And yet we're not really doing very much about it. So mm. I, I hope if the book really sort of impresses home anything, it's it, it, it's it, it's a sort of fragility of things we take for granted, places we take for granted in the present. And in some cases, I'm, I'm afraid, I mean, again, it's, it's sounding like it's a sort of horror, but rather than history, but a lot of these places that were wiped out are, are kind of awful premonitions of the likely future. You know, there could be another pandemic that's much worse. It could be a pathogen in the ice caps or, you know, as, as habitats come into closer contact with animals and humans, that that increases the likelihoods. And so, so, so we're, we're doing an awful lot to sort of foredoom ourselves. Um, but at the same time, there, there is hope in the book because 
these places are not forgotten, you know, by definition. Um, there's a lot about how they're remembered, how they filter into almost like the sort of the, the bloodstream of national consciousness, how they can be invoked for positive things um, in terms of like fighting injustices. Um, and also even in some strange cases, how, you know, it, it's a matter of perspective. What seems ruined and lost isn't always in the long term. Um, the Anglo-Saxons thought Bath was like a, you know, like a perennially lost city mm. but then it came back also think what happened to londinium mm. it became a ghostly shell after the disintegration of the roman empire sort of like patrolled by wolves and infested with brambles and viking invaders. like the people who, who lived where covent garden is now they used to look across at this harrowing shell and they're like god that's a write-off mm. but then of course king alfred came and reconquered it and and it's still with us today it, it did revert briefly back to a ghost city during pandemic so <laughs> it is a matter of perspective and you know it's sort of said that if you stand on the cliffs of donich you can hear the sort of the bells of the 50 churches there are only ever actually seven churches but i don't want to ruin the spell um <laughs> like like sounding from the deep and you know I, i've seen some incredibly alarming studies and um I just, a lot of my friends were it's not that bad yeah, it's exaggerating but there's some studies that show that by the end of the century quite a lot of london is going to be mm. underwater Probably. So who knows, maybe people then will go up to, you know, Ham Hampstead Heath and, and claim they can hear the the bells of the Wren churches sounding from the deep. So yeah, it, 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 I think it evoked a mixture of emotions when writing it, but, but it certainly wasn't too pessimistic by the time I'd finished. It did feel like there was some hope. Absolutely. Yeah, that's fascinating. Well, Matt, I think it's time for us to, to get to the, the meat of this podcast, which is the time travelling. So if you could travel through time, what year would you like to visit? I would like to visit 1965. And I'm, I'm sure lots of your listeners will have a sort of quite a vivid mental picture of what, what that was like. You know, the sort of booming post-war society, the swinging 60s, the introduction of, you know, technological um, revolutions like, you know, the, the fridge and the car and birth pangs of the sort of fashion industry. And, you know, a, a sense of kind of liberation, perhaps. But of course, there was there was another side to that. And that that's often, I think, quite a sort of London-centric view. And in other parts of the country, somewhat more sinister things uh, were going on. Mm. And we're, we're going to get into it. But before we do, I just was, I was desperate to ask you, because there are so many really beautiful and haunting scenes from this book that we could have gone to mm. um why did you choose the one that we're going to today and maybe you'd like to introduce where we're going to be in 1965 yes so we're going to go to the Trewerin valley um which was then in marionethshire now in Gwynedd. it's in north wales um and we're going to witness um a, a sort of a, a devastating act of betrayal really that um, leads to wanton destruction um, and one that was so bitterly resisted. And I chose it because um, it's interesting, a, a lot of the lost places that I write about, that, that, that there was no possibility of any resistance. You, I mean, you can't really do much when you've got a ferocious sea storm that, that's, that's clawing churches and streets off cliffs. You can't really do much um, when the Black Death is like billowing through society also because it's in the modern era the documentation is richer um particularly newspaper diaries photographs when we go back to sort of medieval lost cities it, it might be quite hard to pick three specific days um w without too much kind of conjecture and more than anything i think this is just a although it doesn't really have a happy ending it, it, it's one hell of a story and it's shocking and most people in Wales would would be very familiar, will be very familiar with it. Um, but I think not enough people know about it in 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 other parts of the United Kingdom. Mm. So before we get to um, the first scene that we're going to visit in 1965, could you give listeners a bit of background? What has been happening up until this point that has led um, the characters that we're going to meet and the people we've met to that point? Right. Well, a couple of days before... Christmas 1955 the inhabitants of one of the solely Welsh-speaking villages left there weren't that many left at that stage were going about their daily business so they were milking the cows they were watching the you know the the, the water pour into the 
creamy protuberance of the Triwaran River. People were going about their sort of farming duties, having their snacks of currant buns. They were reciting poetry and harp, because in, in, in this valley, all the farmers were poets, all the poets were farmers. Um, and then someone casually turns to the Welsh edition of the Liverpool Daily Post, and it had you know all, all sorts of types of news about various national contests. It, there was the news that Wales was going to get its own capital, Cardiff. Um, and then right at the end, something that they weren't expecting to read, um, which essentially said that their village was going to be drowned. It was going to be turned into an enormous reservoir because Liverpool needed more drinking water. And it was done in a very sort of matter of fact, a bit like the way the you know, the fall of the Berlin Wall was, 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 was kind of promulgated by the communists side. Like very matter of fact, just like, oh, we're going to be doing some water experiments in the whole of the Triwaran Valley. The river's going to be impounded and it's all going to vanish underwater. Now, Liverpool do dispute that, or did dispute that version of events. And it is true that they had gone out and taken boring and they had written some letters, just to a fraction of the houses. But it was a very vague, vaguely worded letter. It just mentioned an engineering project relating to water, which could have meant anything, particularly because the river used to flood when it was in spate. And it was a boring official looking. No one really paid it much um, notice. So th th they get wind of the fact that their village is in the crosshairs. And as you can imagine, this precipitates a kind of the mother of all resistance campaigns. You know, a lady called Elizabeth Watkin Jones forms the Capel Kalen Defence Committee. That's the name of the village after the chapel. And they get everyone all over Wales and further afield just to send these beautifully vitriolic letters, which sort of rain down upon the Corporation of Liverpool and on Whitehall as well, um, the Welsh Ministry, just sort of saying this is the absolute absolutely horrific betrayal. They said the whole nation has been driven to a sort of white-hot indignation, and they call the councillors all sorts of terrible things, like sort of like gangsters and scouser fascists, and, um, you know, like crooks, vandals, and snakes in the grass. And I mean, they're brilliant letters. They're really vivid. Has no effect. It goes to Parliament, voted through, obviously deeply problematic, because it's English MPs that give it the majority. Every single Welsh MP, apart from one, opposes it. All sorts of other forms of resistance, little sort of trips to Liverpool to to, 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 to remonstrate, and e even more violent forms of protest as well. But all these um, fall on deaf ears and work on the valley. The, the rape of Troy White is usually what it's called, proceeded. And that, that takes us to the, the first day that we're going to a, a, a very sad day for many. Exactly. So would you like to tell us where, where we are and what, 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 what is the date, first of all? Yeah, so it's 15th of August 1965, and we're standing on the bank, looking down into the valley, and there were sort of mournful figures shuffling about, some of them in tears, lots of them with cameras, lots of them scribbling things in notebooks. And they're staring down at what was once their thriving village, but it's now a sort of watery Golgotha. It's just a kind of graveyard, because this was the day when the reservoir reached capacity. It had been the culmination of, of a rather sort of harrowing process, um, whereby the agents of the Corporation of Liverpool had turned up and systematically, forensically dismantled virtually everything in the valley. So the school got shut down, um, they had their final lesson, posed for a photograph outside, received a cake from Plaid Cymru, the Welsh Nationalist Political Party, and then it was simply ripped down. A few months earlier had been held a dissolution, sort of, like, sort of poignantly ironic that, that they use that word, dissolution ceremony in the chapel, after which, again, it was yanked down, um, this Methodist chapel, you know, normally very austere, then and, and it just became this pile of rubble. And some of the stone from the chapel was actually used insultingly in the construction of the dam, as, as someone put it, like these stones that were saturated in hymns and prayer were used to actually build the, the devil's dam that was going to wipe out um, the whole way of life. They then scoured the whole valley of train lines, of trees, houses, of course. The agents of Liverpool Corporation had turned up to dig up the dead, which was announced on, on this rather tactlessly 
on a sort of pin board in front of a pile of rocks just with scrappy sheets of a4 mm. saying you know if you if you want your dead to be dug up then you have to apply and you have to pay a certain amount and they had the choice they could either like dig up their um ancestors or or, or you know, family relatives, or they could be left sort of snug under this blanket of concrete just with a lonely plaque. And essentially then the the, the valley was, as, as, as the Manic Street Preacher's song goes, ready for drowning, mm. which inspired this. And from that moment on, when the rain fell in the Merrienethshire hills, its flow to the sea was impeded by this enormous dam and the water amassed in the valley there was um 60 62.4 million gallons of water had amassed and what these people are doing when we arrive and visit them um on that day is that they're, they're watching their old houses um just sort of melt into the water if you can imagine just how sort of moving and, and horrific that must have felt and the the lots of vivid eyewitness accounts there's um one um actually of a many years later um someone recalls what they saw this is from an individual known as uh, elwyn edwards he said it was a, a an incredibly wet day i remember the water coming out there was nothing left not a tree a hedge no sheep cattle or birds singing it was deathly quiet like a funeral we lost our heritage we lost everything and for him it wasn't really a reservoir at all it was more of a graveyard uh, another eyewitness Aaron Price or Jones um, he was 12 when he saw his parents uh, 20 acre farm lost to the waters I remember the flooding it was a tremendously wet day it wasn't a slow process at all one day you were looking at a particular spot and the next day it was gone beneath the water and lots of these people try to live as close as possible to what had formerly been um their village and, and they were rehoused in many cases by the corporation of liverpool um one couple john and mabel evans made terms with the corporation quite too too with just a little too much alacrity for people's liking they, they, they thought that you know that they, they should have been a bit more loyal and held out and argued but they moved into a house in the hills above bala much nicer house with kind of electricity and more space and but then sadly a couple of years later they were killed in a car crash and everybody thought this was um sort of just recompense like sent by god for dealing with this slippery and mendacious council so mournful scenes and actually to this day in welsh folklore it's said that birds won't fly over lakes that have witnessed a drowning or or any any form of death and it's obviously it's folklore but when i went the the birds wouldn't they wouldn't fly over the reservoir and it was very haunting and sullen um very still and the water felt kind of restless and pent up and it's amazing to think at times of drought the water level dips and you can actually see the ruins of the ghost village um emerging from the deep you can you can see the stubs of buildings you can see the twisted roots of the trees and when this happens they're often spray painted there's an amazing picture from the 19th and just drowned by english pigs so it, it it's down there and you can sort of feel that ghostly presence mm. wow well how beautifully told thank you so much so haunting it's such an amazing scene a uh, very obviously a very 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 sad scene so I can really picture us stood there with them. Um, and thank you for reading the accounts as well of the people who were there. How had this happened? How, that's what I was really kind of... Mm. I mean, it feel, it's an incredibly callous thing to have done. What, what was the argument that Liverpool Corporation were making and how was it allowed to have happened? Well, they, <laughs> they made an awful lot of arguments and the, the polemic was really spearheaded by this, I would say, Pugnacious is probably the best way of describing her. Liverpudlian MP for Labour called Bessie Braddock, who, I mean, I, I, I hadn't actually heard of her, but I, I just mentioned her and my mum was, you know, her, her eyeballs started rolling and she's like, oh God, I remember Bessie Braddock. Like she was this formidable figure. And in the council chamber and in the House of Commons, the arguments were as follows. Essentially, Wales was part of the United Kingdom. It wasn't its own sort of principality it wasn't and therefore as they put it given that we were a tight little island 
sometimes you know the, the interests of a minority have to be sacrificed to the majority interest for the sake of progress and advancement. Liverpool claimed that without this new source of water, it was simply going to run out of drinking water, it wasn't going to be able to meet its commitments to supply water to Merseyside, and it was also going to impede sort of industrial output. And these arguments were given quite short shrift by the people of Capel Kalen, who sort of said, well, it's just greed, isn't it? They're just going to sell the water off. And there's this amazing placard they had in one of the protests with a glass of water, like like the one in front of you, and, and, it, and it's just got a sort of village at the bottom, and it says, Liverpool, do you want the spectre in your water? Other arguments were put forward. Liverpool said, well, there's actually more Welsh people living in Liverpool than in Capel Kalen, which is true. There, there were nasty arguments, that because w- w- when, when the sort of Welsh resistance campaign said this is a whole way of culture and mm. tradition and particularly language so like language was seen as the the most kind of poignant manifestation of welsh identity the number of native welsh speakers was had actually fallen from 50 percent to 30 percent over the first half of the 20th century so the optics of of dr- drowning a, or one of the few welsh speakers were, were, were just awful but people the people were sort of saying well it's, it's a backwards language it's irrelevant you know we've got all these kind of news bulletins in English and English language newspaper like cinema television we don't need that utilitarian I suppose would be the the catch-all term they're sort of saying well you know the whole country will benefit from this so so let's do it and of course it had actually happened before which is remarkable in in the 1880s Lake Verney I don't know if I pronounced that correctly if I have sorry uh, was drowned by Liverpool for a, a reservoir but there was there was nothing like the same resistance because the this Welsh nationalism and, and 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 the sense of the whole kind of existential threats to Welsh culture wasn't as sharp at that stage as it had been sort of later on mm. and indeed other villages were drowned in in Wales but with the consent of the Welsh mm. that was okay um you actually find quite a lot of there's one in, if you read Austerlitz, the Seabold novel, there's a character who comes from this drowned village. But it's when it was forced upon them by the, these, these interlopers, as they saw it, that's what they couldn't deal with because it seemed to tap into such a, a, a rich vein of bitterness and resentment given the whole history of Wales, which we'll see on the, on the next day. Yeah, I definitely want to get into more of that um, in the in your next scene. But just before we move on to it, I just wanted to spend some time talking about um, this word drowned, because it's mm. such an emotive word, isn't it? And it's very deliberately drowned, not flooded. Or, yeah. uh, could you talk a bit about that? Yes, they, they, they always refer to it as a, a drowning. It's, uh, well, it, it's an aggressive word, suggestive of Murder. Malevolent, yeah. Malevolence. And, I mean, it's, it's more than just drowning. They, they also used to talk about how it was a, a terrible synecdoche of, of, of Wales, Welsh culture being diluted. It, the water also has association with tears. You see that again and again. Just the, 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 the a, a mass, a massing of the, the, the tears of, 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 of all the kind of grievances against the Welsh over the centuries it's also they they said it was like their society was being pissed upon mm. by the english and drained as well because remember it's it, it's draining the what is taking this kind of precious natural resource you know that that that's what some welsh people felt had been going on ever since the wake of the sort of norman conquest when when these sort of bastides were plonked down and native welsh expelled and and, and the gascon and english colonists moved in so so yeah and, and it's also very much sort of described as a graveyard, like a, a, a sort of watery graveyard. So all, all, all these associations were, were there and they were harnessed to to great kind of polemical effects, at least, but didn't have any bearing on, on, on the outcome because it was voted through in Parliament. Wales had its MPs, but constitutionally, nothing had actually happened that was technically illegal and 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 it's a it's a spectre that 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 does rear its head elsewhere if you think about you know something like brexit yeah. like how how many mps in scotland voted for brexit yeah. um so when you've got one part of 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 this rather peculiar amalgamation that is the of four nations the united kingdom enforcing its will on another part then it's obviously going to lead to 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 great sort of bitterness and mm. and unease well i think that leads us on really nicely to the next scene that we're going to visit so where are we going to next in 1965 right so it's a crisp autumn day 1965 so this is 
a couple of weeks after Valley has reached its uh, capacity, and we find the publication of a lurid newspaper interview in which the leader of the Free Wales Army pledges that his organisation fully intends to do everything possible to stop the opening of Lynn Kalen of Lake Kalen, um, as it came to be known. It, again, just as you were saying a minute ago, it described it as a drowning, and it said that it would it, it would stop at nothing to prevent the rape of Trey Warren, and they pledged to burn the Union Jack flag, which, you know, like a hugely symbolic kind of gesture. And the Free Wales Army were a much more sort of militant wing of the resistance. So you did have the sort of official nationalist resistance from Plaid Cymru, which was uh, led by uh, the intellectuals of Gwynfor Evans at the time. But although he he, he wouldn't outright condone um, acts of violence um, against the reservoir construction of it, but, but they did stop at actually inciting violence. They, they wouldn't sort of instruct uh, the, the party members to go and blow up the engineering works or the transformers or anything like that but that wasn't the case um for these more militant wings so so this really alarmed particularly the dignitaries from the corporation of liverpool because as uh, as we will see it, they didn't want to just as may actually have been much more pragmatic just open open the thing but not make too much of a fuss about it instead they actually planned this incredibly lavish mm. opening ceremony which was sort of grossly insensitive and this is what the free wells army are targeting that's basically what this threat means it, it, it's implied that something horrific is going to happen at the opening ceremony um the date of which was set for the 21st of october 1965 and and they did have form on this because in may 1963 the reservoir had been bombed you know an extraordinary slight travesty in, in, in a sense because there, there were these four individuals two of whom were students um who obviously believed very strongly in the cause and there was a, an expat who was in british columbia who who was so moved by the, the the news of what was being planned by liverpool he came all the way back opened uh an espresso bar that which were big in the um 1960s and this became a sort of incubator of radical thought, insurrectionary impulses. So it was in this espresso bar that these three kind of started discussing what they could possibly do. Um, they recruited another. And then actually on a very snowy night, they travelled just with bombs in, in their car and uh, went in to the transformer, planted the bombs, set them to go off. They didn't really know what they were doing. They didn't know if they were going to be sort of blown up themselves or not. They, they were young. Two of them were students. Then they drove back and the bombs did go off. You know, the, the trailer and Valley, like, the, the blast kind of ripped through the, the freezing cold air. And they were caught because they left snowy footprints in the snow, like leading away. And actually one of them cut their hands open on barbed wire. So there was blood in the snow um, as well. So it was almost like a perfect kind of lead. They got put on trial. Um, some of them were sent to prison. And that was just the tip of the iceberg. There was actually 20 explosions during the period of the construction of the reservoir and the dam beginnings of 1961 so th this was no idle threat people were sort of worried about whether this was going to take a bloody turn you know whether the reservoir maybe wasn't going to be filled with water but with blood because the free wells army were going to set their sights on they, they were a very sort of palpable presence because all over certain parts of what mainly north wells it, it must be said had been appearing graffiti and again, my Welsh accent is so bad, but I do have Welsh blood, but I... Coffwich Trewerin. This would just appear. Um, bridges, tunnels, rocks. Still, to this day, um, just on a sort of bruise of red paint. And when, when you go to the... If you visit the lake today, you can see insignia from the Free Wales Army. And pe people were really worried that they, that they were actually linking up with the IRA and learning insurrectionary tactics from that quarter. So it, it, I would say it participated. It, it contributed, rather, to the general undercurrent of mm. unease this very sort of queasy autumn when you know after this long drawn out process of drowning it was finally going to be opened and the reason they they, they had such traction of course is like, like we're saying it is it, because of a whole history of england and wales mm. could you translate what coughwich trerin means uh yeah just uh remember trerin sometimes you would see coffee or Kalen remember what happened at 
Trey Ware and, and, and yeah. And I believe this is graffiti that you still could, you might see around Wales even today. Yes, yeah. you, you do. And, and, and actually it's, it's taken up all over the world. Mm. Remarkably, there, were, the, the, there was a, a Kurdish demonstration on the banks of uh, the reservoir when one of their um, communities was threatened by a, a Turkish dam. And it became a lightning rod actually for, for, for grievances of you know, lo- lots of different varieties. But it's still, I mean, the, the memory of that, this is the thing about the book that obviously it's, it's a book about places which to some extent aren't really remembered, but it has passed into the popular consciousness, particularly in Wales. When I was in the archives, the Mary and Ethesha archives, reading these letters that so many people had, had penned, so it was like wonderful, wonderfully acrimonious, beautifully insulting letters. I, I met a lady and um, she said that she'd, she'd named like all her sons, Caelan, just to perpetuate the memory of it. So although these places have often physically vanished, they do live on in in the memory and the imagination. Mm. And this was about much more than small, because it was a small community. It it wasn't like a vast city by any stretch of the imagination. It it had a chapel, had a post office, it had a school, the the farmer's houses. It didn't have a pub. It it had a, a request railway stop so not even a proper station one of the most sort of elegiac moments i suppose was when the the final passenger train went to capel Kalen and a band appeared dressed in black and the train could have trundled off into oblivion and never ran again because after which the the track was um demolished it gained so much resonance because it seemed to many people just like the the latest manifestation of the age-old saga of repression you know, if, if you go all the way back to the Norman Conquest, the the, the, the warlords, you know, like the de Clare families and the de Lacy's w- w- would go in and carve out sort of territory to the west of Offa's Dyke. And these were called the marches. And initially, at least, the, these were lawless zones. They'd been called the sort of Wild West of Britain. And the awful lot of sort of torture and massacres and oppression, the native Welsh being driven further westwards uh, as these principalities were carved out and that that was hugely painful as a memory because although medieval welsh people probably wouldn't or almost certainly wouldn't have conceived of a unified wales because it was split up into rival kingdoms it wasn't it hadn't coalesced like um anglo-saxon england would eventually do so angloland they, they did have an awareness that they were part of this much older civilization that sort of Celtish, mm. who, who who spoke to the Brythonic languages and or, almost the sort of original population of, not quite the original, but the, an earlier population of Britain before the Romans arrived, who, who had once had kingdoms that spread across the whole, much of the landmass, until the Anglo-Saxons were invited in to settle in, and, and there was this sort of westward kind of um, you know, exodus, and, and they were forcibly driven into the the annex you know the the in, in, into wales so so the, the, there was that sense as well and, and and little by little from the middle ages as they saw it in the 1960s aspects of welsh nationhood had been stripped away edward the first campaign um you know the statute of rudlan began to sort of carve up welsh territory into english style shires um and under henry the eighth you know the acts of union it was absorbed into england it was sort of helpfully informed that it had never really had any right to exist. So it sounds horribly topical at the moment. And the the language Welsh, the, the Welsh speech, was, was castigated as sort of sinister and unnecessary and actually banned from mansions and law courts. And so to get ahead, you had to be able to speak English. It seemed like all manner of injustices and, and, and actually drowning a bastion of, of pure Welsh culture just seemed horribly pernicious and... Um, painful in in the context of that narrative. Mm, absolutely. From what you've said, it kind of it really seems like this particular moment is so powerful and so painful um, for this community and for Wales as a whole because it's happening at a moment when there is that there, there is a greater articulation of Welsh nationalism politically. How much support was there for like an independent Wales in 1965, and how much was what was happening in Truran? influencing that debate well it's a very difficult question to answer because it you, it's, it'd be tempting to sort of establish this sort of 
causal link mm. sort of saying well these sorts of injustices significantly augmented the support for independent Wales and of course in some quarters it did but the, there was a referendum I believe in 1979 um, conclusively rejected the idea of a sort of not not so much independent but, but of Wales having its own assembly mm. or sort of parliament perhaps and the memory of Trewe and what was invoked, you know, when the Welsh Assembly in in more recent times was inaugurated, but it, it's 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 hard to see if there the was a direct. I, I'm I'm not convinced it, it, people necessarily wanted to be an independent country. I think they just wanted to be a, an equal partner to some extent and not to be totally con- screwed over by by this aggressive neighbour that could act with impunity. Mm-hmm. Now, no doubt the. I mean, th- there is no doubt there were Welsh nationalists who did want that, who who wanted no sort of English involvement and who wanted their country back. Like hands off Wales was something you'd see again and again in the placards. But I don't think the majority of people in were actually wanted to be an independent mm. country at that at that stage. Just before we move on to your final scene, which is the kind of um it's the climax of of the events we've been speaking about so far. Yeah. Um, I wanted to kind of look a bit broader out and talk about the book again because mm. throughout the book, in each place you visit, you really deftly weave in some of the most important themes of British history, whether it's you know the rise of agriculture in Scarborough or the these kind of uh, like Enlightenment philosophy or colonialism and now Welsh nationalism. How aware were you when you were writing the book that you weren't just writing histories of these like little specific places and their specific histories, but you were actually writing something that together told us something about the history of Britain? Yes, well, uh, very. I try. I tried to be sort of like very aware of that because I. Well, it's always very hard at the drawing board stage to kind of almost like X-ray what the eventual book is going to be like. But I was aware that if it was just the story of eight or so places that had once thrived suffered some catastrophe and then vanished that could very easily get quite repetitive and 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 maybe would have seemed slightly pointless as well so exactly as you mentioned i wanted to reflect upon how what we've established as what what other historians have established as the, the great turning points in english history the things that have had a transformative impact upon the country, just like the ones you mentioned, um, agriculture, industrialization, the Black Death and and philosophical ideas, so on. To almost look at the flip side of that, to look at how, in yes, they, they have been formative, but in other ways, they've had the opposite effect. And what, what it's meant to amount to is a sort of a sort of unusual, if you like, an alternative, perhaps like a shadow history of Britain through the places that have slipped through the fingers of history mm. and it allowed me to identify by by bringing in the big themes um which incidentally is also how i've selected how i whittled it down because there's an awful lot of these and i mean you've got no idea when when, when you give talks about this kind of thing the, the, you, you see someone looking very sort of disappointed and you just know they're about to say but you haven't mentioned my the lost <laughs> village at the end of my street how how could you give a talk you know and and, and have the audaciousness not to so the, there's there's a lot but i wanted to look at ones that had fallen prey to different mm. themes be it sort of plague war economic shifts climate change etc and that led me to identify what i call kind of agents of oblivion mm. which again sounds um slightly terrifying but the these are the sorts of forces which throughout history actually from prehistoric times so even before our history to presently have traditionally wiped places out mm. Because once you once you look at it that way, that there's not actually that many, and and it's just very alarming because you 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 can immediately see how these agents of oblivion are potentially still with us. Like it gives you a new perspective on just you know this idea of not 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 that your listeners would have this whiggish idea that history should always be about sort of progress, but there is there is that slight idea that you know advancement, but actually. There are false starts and dead ends. Mm. And, you know, agriculture could be one of them, you know, yeah. if you take the long view. I mean, that's exactly what I was going to say, because I think that's why it makes for such a refreshing, um, albeit dark read as a book, because it does slightly challenge. It's so easy to think of um, history as just being an accumulation of things on top of each other. And especially um, if you're a historian of London, I always get that impression about London. It's just kind of layers upon layers upon layers. Mm. Nothing's erased. It's only built over or, yeah. you know, and it's really 
refreshing to have a version of the history of this country which is about yeah dead ends and um things that didn't quite take off or you know I just think it it makes for a great read. (laughs) Yeah, it's interesting because it's the the London thing is, I I thought about whether to include London, but in the end, I I wanted to be quite strict with criteria. I'm looking at places that have imploded, have either vanished entirely or left very little. I mean, there are ruins in some instances, but somewhere like London, you could have said Roman London. Why is that not one of the lost cities? But that did actually form the foundation for the later medieval city. And much like so many um, Roman towns and cities as well, were sort of reoccupied and built upon and built over. So I didn't really want to look at places that expanded outwards. I wanted to look at places that collapsed inwards, the sort of imploding topography, not the exploding topography. And that, you know, that, that, that takes you to uh the, these dead ends and um and, and i think it's interesting sort of metaphor because a lot of people's lives are defined by absences and dead ends and failures it's not all sort of success and victory mm. and I, 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 that that was a nice like hopefully a nice sort of mirror mm. to to this idea that like an absence and you can feel it when you go to somewhere like donich where an absence can sometimes have more presence than what's actually there mm. and, and it sort of lingers in the air like a pool and it Hi, it's Violet here, one of the presenters on Travels Through Time. I just wanted to let you know that this special episode is supported by Faber, the legendary independent publishing house that's home to some of the greatest writers of the last century, and this one. Alongside Matthew's riveting book Shadowlands, they are publishing two other titles this spring, which both continue the distinguished tradition of supporting poetry begun by T.S. Eliot, begun by T.S. Eliot, who was the first poetry editor at Faber back in the 1920s. Catherine Rundle's vivid new biography of John Donne is called Super Infinite, The Transformations of John Donne, and brings the myriad lives of this poet of love, sex and death into focus. Also recently published is Stasi Poetry Circle by Philip Alterman, the extraordinary story of a creative writing group in communist East Berlin, who used poetry as a political weapon and has been described as Stasiland meets Dead Poet Society. To find out more about these and many other wonderful books, please visit the website faber.co.uk. Well, let's go to our final scene. Um, we're back in 1965. Um, would you like to tell us where we are? Yes, we are very close to where we were in the first scene. Uh, we're standing on the banks of Lynn Kalen and it is a much anticipated day because it's the opening ceremony of um, the reservoir and for this reason uh, a marquee has been erected on the other side um, of the escarpment and there's just one road that leads towards the lake obviously the road used to go through the valley but you wouldn't be able to do that anymore and I, I was saying how when I went, it was a very peaceful place, but the atmosphere is febrile. It's anything but peaceful. Um, the, the 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 lake behind is is restless, and there are protesters everywhere. Um, there's about five hundred protesters. Not so much people who had once lived in Capelcalen. They'd moved on with their lives. A few of them, but people from all over Wales and further afield who were just absolutely horrified at the injustice of what had happened and and actually it was a lightning conductor for a wider sense of unease there were people there saying like ban animal cruelty like what did that have to do with it and and end forest fires and um so so there was a bit of that as well but the 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 main bone of contention was of course not just what had happened but this horribly insensitive way liverpool corporation were going about celebrating it because they were sending 400 dignitaries and people thought this was just the most insane thing to do. Gwenfor Evans, the leader of Plaid Cymru, wrote to Liverpool Corporation, repeating, said, what on earth are you playing? Do you not know how bad this looks? You've just drowned this village against everybody's consent, and you're going to turn up and have a tea party um, and sort of toast yourselves in a self-aggrandising manner on, on the banks. As usual, a very patronising response came back from Liverpool saying, oh, nonsense, we've always enjoyed the best of relations in the valley and we're a tight little island. Let's not think of this as an injustice, but let's um, marvel in this feat of modern engineering whilst celebrating an um, atmosphere of collaboration, which obviously 
at stark odds with what most people felt. So the protesters are waiting there and they've got placards. These placards are being waved by a diverse range of people. So you've got sort of the intellectuals with their slicked back hair. Um, you've got um, old ladies brandishing walking sticks um, in, in a vaguely menacing manner. You've got the, the young guns from organisations like the Free Wales Army with that Union Jack flag for which they have a very specific design. Children, you've got lots of people who've who, who've been bussed in from elsewhere and they're all waiting and then after a, an hour or so on the horizon the cavalcade appears. This is procession of cars and buses which has come down from Liverpool and they somehow think they're just going to be able to drive to the marquee and get on with it but that's very far from the case because the minute the convoy gets anywhere near all these people they take their and just thwack it down on the bonnet not only that but they start smashing the wing mirrors they rip um the aerials off from the cars some of them actually throw themselves in front of the bonnets um and there are police there but the police can do precious little to actually sort of stop this from going on more than anything the protesters are just screaming insults through the very wisely wound up windows um you know like hands off whales you traitors go back you know like stop robbing whales and it's a scene of pandemonium and as one newspaper report put it it was a wonder that the very basin itself the reservoir didn't sort of like boil over such was the um sort of profundity of the emotions that were raging that day it's threatening to get very ugly and then someone sees across the way that there are some other cars arriving right on the other side where the marquee is and they get wind of the fact that the most important dignitaries um had actually approached um a different way and were you know ensconcing themselves in their nice marquee and and this absolutely enrages the the crowd or the, the mob as the querulous mob is referred to in the Liverpool Daily Post. And, and they break through the police restraining barrier and rush up the hill and, and gush into the marquee. They, they find that a stage um, upon which is standing, as many of the Welsh protesters thought, the triptych of evil. That is the chief constable of Liverpool, the Lord Mayor in his finery, and then a particularly reviled figure, which was Alderman Frank Kane who was the chairman of the dreaded water committee, um, who'd spearheaded the whole campaign in the first place. Th these three and, and the Liverpudlians, in general, they, they try to make the most of it. They say, well, it's nice that you've come to help us celebrate the, obviously the, anything but. And then then what was meant to be a 45 minute um, ceremony is re reduced to this three minute travesty. Basically, they start, the Welsh start singing a hymn in Welsh. So none, none of the Liverpudlians can understand it and um, what they were actually singing was all english are assholes <laughs> but the, the the lord mayor sort of nodded and uh, sort of like pensive <laughs> agreement so this is this is sort of very nice then things get really ugly a brick is chucked at the lord mayor uh, a flagpole ends up in the eye of um one of the dignitaries half of the marquee actually collapses they they realize that they're going to have to sort of speed up or risk sort of like physical injury um so the lord mayor and some others start making their speech and no sooner do they they get a couple of words in than everyone starts shouting you 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 fascist scouser or like you fascist scouser bastard there's so much swearing to and it goes <laughs> on and on, on so at which point the, the actual lines that connected the lord mayor's microphone are cut and he's seen just sort of blabbering like a goldfish no one can hear what he's saying um then the crowd breaks out into um a, a, a welsh hymn um, which completely drowns out um, what's going on. This enrages the Lord Mayor, um, who basically tries to bring the whole thing um, to a conclusion. So he goes and yanks um, this lever, which sends millions and millions of gallons of water from the Stilling Basin into the river, through which it will um, has been diverted to get to Liverpool. And he declares this marvellous feat of engineering and this symbol of great national cooperation open and everyone just stands there and listens to the gushing of the water to the roar of the water um so so the protesters are drowned out just in the same way as they themselves had previously drowned out the lord mayor the sort of poignancy of the moment was lost on no one like here is the actual water gushing out the welsh way of life the nation had the culture being drowned diluted um pissed upon all, the, all these things that we were saying earlier 
um and they're, they're sort of stopped in their tracks and, and and the gravity of the situation sinks in at which point the three operatives from the free wales army try as they've been planning to set the union jack on fire but um inevitably something goes wrong it's too much wind. they don't manage it they, they keep on trying to light it um but the flag proves resilience so they stamp on it instead they trample upon it um and eventually just toss it into the reservoir and that's one of the last things that they see at the summer is, is just this um, battered and mangled flag just kind of scudding across the surface of the freshly opened reservoir the dignitaries from liverpool don't stick around for that much longer because they've organized a, a, a five-course luncheon and they're really looking forward to sinking their teeth into some nice welsh lamb so they scarper and everyone else is just left there in in a state of, of shock and misery and that's that what an incredible set piece um for our final scene i mean and so wonderfully told thank you what are we to make of this are we to really believe that the liverpool corporation thought that this was a genuinely okay thing to do or do you think that they kind of knew it was going to really piss everybody off well they certainly <laughs> they certainly realized that latterly because they in 2005 an official apology was issued for the injustice that was done at the time i'm, I'm actually not convinced I, if you if you read the sort of arguments they're coming out with i think a lot of people who were instrumental in that were convinced that this was for the best that this was in the wider interests you know the ends justify the means and although they, they were derogatory and dismissive I, I don't think they were quite the, the the sort of cartoon villains that they're often portrayed as whether or not they actually needed the water is is, is a moot point because they, they were going around saying that if we don't get new sources of water like people are gonna die they're, they're gonna be famished they i really don't think that's i don't see how that could possibly have been true if it, um, someone said well if they hadn't drowned capo Kalin, you know people would have died on mass because there would have been no drinking water it just sort of like beggars belief so their, their arguments did veer into the histrionic um at times but i i, I think yeah a lot of them bessie braddock the the chairman of the committee thought that this was in the best interest of the country but they didn't really acknowledge the the, the strength of feeling and the the perseverance of welsh nationhood which then then gets a philip this does have an impact in a sense you know it it, it, it indirectly leads to the establishment of a welsh language bbc station um, a, a minister is appointed for welsh affairs and as we've seen people people remembered it mm. um but yeah it, it it's astonishing really that it that it happened at all mm. um and actually when you, when you tell people about it they often you'll not believe that they're sort of like well there must be more to it than mm. that but and they just read in the newspaper their village was to be drowned and so it was yeah well it's a really sad story but a fascinating one as well and really well told so thank you so much just before we head back to the present day mm -hmm. um and come back to soho radio studios where we are now in broadwick street yeah. you are allowed to bring back a memento from 1965 i guess to commemorate this terrible thing that happened what memento would you like to bring i think it would have to be the flag because i think that it was hugely symbolic because it, remember it's it's not a nice sort of uh, well ironed flag a few iron flags but it, it it's tra <laughs> it's trampled upon it's like cr and it, and it, and it, it, it it's just sort of suggestive of how so many people saw the, uh, this union as bogus it, it sort of exposes the, the the void if you like that underlies myths of national identity but it's also a testament to the impuissance of the resistance they didn't succeed in resisting it you know the drowning went ahead just as they didn't succeed in burning the flag you know at a time when our society is increasingly sort of divided over the last five years or so i think that's that's very powerful i'm not suggesting people burn <laughs> union jack flags or anything like that but it, do, it does sort of show you that the tensions that lie beneath this kind of the, the national myths which the corporation of liverpool were very keen to sort of promulgate <laughs> 
Mm. And I think that, yeah, that object perfectly represents the story that you've just told. So I think it's a fantastic choice. Well, Matt, thank you so much for joining us today on Travels Through Time. I've really, really enjoyed visiting the Valley of Truellen um, with you. Thanks for having me. Yeah. And, and enjoy talking to you about this wonderful book as well. Great. Thank you. That was me, Artemis Irvin, speaking to Dr. Matthew Green about the year 1965. If you enjoyed our conversation and want to find out more, you can visit our website, tttpodcast.com. But you can also read an extract of Matthew's wonderful books on our partner's website, unseenhistories.com. We recorded this episode at Soho Radio Studios, which can be found on Broadwick Street in London. It's a fantastic place to record, so if you ever find yourself wanting to meet for an interview or do a podcast yourself, you can book a studio there via their website, soho radiostudios.com. Thanks so much for listening. We'll see you next week.